good afternoon. Welcome to LifeHouse. We, LifeHouse is a nonprofit agency. Uh, we serve about 200 people with developmental disabilities, which includes autism. And uh, we're really happy to see everybody here today. Uh, I heard Temple speak about 25 years ago and have never forgotten that experience and it stays with me today. So it's really exciting for me and I think all of you will uh, be equally impressed with um, her story. And to tell you a little bit more, Nancy Reese is going to do an introduction of Temple. Thank you. Hi. Lighthouse is privileged to introduce Dr. Temple Grandin. There's so much to say about her and everything that she has accomplished in her life. Temple was diagnosed with autism in 1950. Not much was known about autism at that time. Temple's mother was an innovative thinker and never stopped urging Temple to do things that she thought she was not capable of. Temple earned a bachelor's degree in psychology from Franklin Pierce College in 1970, her master's degree in animal science from Arizona State University in 1975, and doctor degree in animal science from the University of Illinois in 1989. She's considered a philosophical leader of both animal welfare and autism advocacy movements. She's written several books, and I know she's already been signing some, and she'll continue to sign after her, her talk at Point Reyes uh, booth number two. And she is currently a professor of animal studies at Colorado State University. Finally, she said that if I could snap my fingers and become non-autistic, I would not do so. Autism is a part of who I am. Please welcome Dr. Temple Grant. Well, it's really great, to, really great to be here today. They told me I got to eat the mic, otherwise it's not going to work. And I was just wondering, how many people here is where animals is their main interest? Okay, what about autism as being the main interest? Okay, we've got quite a bit of each then. Kind of like to know, so I kind of know how to do my remarks. I think I'll start out and just uh, talk a little bit about what autism is. It's a developmental disorder that can vary from an individual that's going to remain nonverbal all the way up to half the people that work in Silicon Valley. <laughs> because if you take a few of the social circuits out, then you got geek circuits to figure out all kinds of really, really cool stuff. And I just saw a t-shirt over there of some big computer show and it says something like Geek Fest. And I go, yep, I can really, really get into that. <laughs> now, another question I constantly get asked all the time is how would autism help me in my work with animals? Well, I'm a visual thinker. I think completely in pictures. If I don't think in pictures, I don't think. And the HBO movie did an absolutely fantastic job of showing how my visual thinking works. Like I said, shoe, and a bunch of different shoe pictures just came right up. See, the thing is, my thinking is specific. I used to think that everybody thought in pictures. And then when I wrote thinking in pictures, which instantly is on the book stand, I was shocked to find out in the, the mid-90s that... Most people, if I said to think about a church steeple, or maybe think about a highway overpass, they get a generalized generic one. I see only specific ones. Now, I think most people here in San Francisco, if I said bridge, they're going to see a specific one. Uh, so I don't think I would use uh, that. But the thing that shocked me was that other people had these vague, generalized, kind of tower-like things. It was just all very vague in general. See, and up until that time, I thought everybody, I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't know my thinking was different. So some of the very first work I did with cattle, I got down in the chutes to see what are the animals seeing. Because I noticed that one cattle handling facility, the animals would go right through the facility. And in another cattle handling facility, they wouldn't. And it would be something simple like orientation to the sun. If the sun was blinding the cattle, they wouldn't go in. If there was a shadow or the chute entrance was too dark, they wouldn't go in. Another thing that I had to answer for myself very early on since I was been working with the slaughter plants is, 
do the cattle know they're going to get slaughtered? And I found that they behaved the same way in both places. In the movie, they had to change the name of the Swift plant in Arizona to, the, to Abbott because Swift is still a brand name that still exists, so it's too much, too much trouble to get the rights on it, so they just changed it into Abbott. And so at Abbott, I found that the cattle behaved the same way as it did in the feed yard. And a lot of that excitement and agitation you might see in a slaughter plant is due to just being novel. You know, sometimes you get a steer that gets berserk at the county fair and runs through the midway. Well, the reason why that happens is because at the county fair, there's lots of new stuff there the steer's never seen before, like flags, bikes, and balloons. Well, you want to get your steer accustomed to those things before he goes to the fair. You see, that is reaction to novelty. Now, the thing is, with animals, if you want to understand them, you've got to get away from language. You totally have to get away from language. Because if you stay thinking in language, you're not going to understand animals. Think about what he's seeing. What's your dog looking at? What's your dog hearing? What is he smelling when he's checking out the local tree? He knows who's been there, when they were there, are they a friend or foe? There's lots and lots and lots of information on the local tree. It's very detailed, sensory-based information. Now, one of the things that being a sensory-based thinker does to you is the way that you form concepts is different. It's what's called bottom-up thinking. So if I want to teach a dog how to sit, I've got to do it in many different places. If I only taught him how to sit in the living room, he might think that sitting only applies to the living room. He's got to learn he's got to do it in the house. He's got to do it outside. He's got to do it at the dog park. He's got to do it along the river here. He's got to do it in a lot of different places. So, you know, what I'm seeing now, one thing that uh, Thinking in Pictures does for me, is everything is specific. You know, when people try to troubleshoot a problem with an animal, or a problem with their autistic kid, or a problem with anything, they'll say something vague, like, how do I handle behavior issues in the classroom? I don't know how to answer that question. Is a kid three years old? Is a kid in high school and they just uh, beat the teacher up? Is a two-year-old having a tantrum? I mean, how you would deal with these things is different. Is it because of fidgets? You know, I've got to have a lot more information. And there was a very, very interesting experiment done at the University of Pittsburgh that showed how the normal mind tends to drop out details. So they took an Asperger person, that's mild autism, they took a fully autistic person who has been speech delay, and they took a regular person and put them in the functional MRI scanner that measures activity in the brain, and they had them read out of a book. Now the autistic person just gets the detail of the words. The Asperger gets both the syntax, the overall whole, and the detail of the words. But guess what happens to the normal person? They drop out the detail. Well, this is the thing I always find a problem. People try to overgeneralize. Not a good thing. Now, the problem with bottom-up thinking is that to get very good at forming concepts, because concepts are formed by specific examples, I've got to experience a lot of different things. It's very important to get kids with autism out doing lots of different things, experiencing lots of stuff. Another thing you've got to do with them is you've got to teach them stuff like turn-taking. You've got to teach them things like manners. Well, you know, always um, you know, be teaching them. And if they do something wrong, don't scream at them. Just say, well, you should have shook Mrs. Jones's hand in that situation. Or if the kid runs behind the counter, you might say, well, only the uh, store staff can go behind the counter. Don't scream no, just give the instruction. Now, to be a bottom-up thinker, okay, to learn about designing cattle handling facilities, what I did is I went to every feed yard in Arizona and I worked cattle. Then I began to see what worked in some facilities and what did not work in some facilities. Bottom-up thinking is putting the pieces together. It's sort of like if I got this great, big, huge jigsaw puzzle, and I had no idea what the picture on the puzzle was because I, did, I don't have the box anymore. I just have the puzzle. And I put it together, and I might get it a third of the way together, and then I realize maybe it's got a picture of a horse on it. That's, sorry, that water bottle just splashed right up in my face. That's, um, that is 
bottom-up thinking. Everything that you teach an animal, or you teach an autistic kid, you get it done by specific example. If you want the dog to generalize, uh, teach them in many different places. But there's some things where you can get one trial learning, especially if it's something really, really scary. Like in my book, Animals in Translation, I wrote about a horse that was afraid of black cowboy hats. Because during a veterinary procedure, somebody had thrown alcohol in his eyes, and that person was wearing a black cowboy hat. So white cowboy hats and white hats were good, black hats were bad. Or you can have a horse that was abused with one particular type of bit. So any bit that feels anything like that bad bit, that's maybe a jointed bit, the horse is going to be afraid of it. And some other kind of bit, it'll be fine. See, animal thinking, since it's sensory based, it's very specific. But it can generalize in kind of a specific way. Like, for example, guys with beards are bad. There was an elephant that was terrified of diesel powered equipment. If it ran with a diesel engine, it was bad. If it ran with a gasoline engine, it was good. Because somebody had probably abused the elephant with a diesel powered uh, construction equipment. And so he associated the sound of a diesel engine, which makes a characteristic sound, with it's different than the sound of a gas engine. See, what I want to try to get you to do is to enter a sensory world. Then you'll start to understand animal behavior. Now, I have found in you know working with people with autism that there's different kinds of thinking. When I wrote some of my very first stuff, I thought that everybody on the spectrum thought in pictures. And then somebody wrote a review on Amazon.com and they said, well, that just simply isn't true. And so when I did a revision of thinking in pictures in 2006, I put in my observations on some other kinds of thinking. But one of the things that's the same in everybody that has autism is they tend to be good at one thing, bad at something else. Very, very specialized skills. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker. Absolutely can't do algebra. There's a ton of kids that can't do algebra the need to jump to geometry and trig. And unfortunately, I never got a chance to go to geometry and trig. That was a gigantic mistake in my math education. Another kind of mind, and this is the computer programmer mind, is the pattern thinker. They think in patterns, like think mathematical patterns, think origami, think organic chemistry molecules, think geodesic domes. That's thinking in patterns. This is the kid that when he's in third or fourth grade, may need to have a high school math book, but he needs to be have special ed reading. You know, and don't make this kid do baby math over and over again because then they'll end up just labeling him oppositional defiant. And I'm really kind of appalled at how um, I just put him giving kids all these labels and getting way too many kids on way too many medications. Now I take medication, take antidepressants, very, very low dose of it. And that works really well for anxiety. And anybody who's interested in reading um, uh, stuff about that, and the thinking in pictures, I write about that. Also in another autism book called The Way I See It, second edition, with information on uh, medication. I don't really want to get into that now, but those two books recommend reading. Okay, let's get back to the third kind of thinker. That's the word thinker. This is the kid that loves history. His favorite thing might be naming all the presidents. And these kids are not visual thinkers. Math skills usually about average. So you have different kinds of specialist minds. And we need to be thinking about what can this kid do when they grow up? Another thing we've got to be doing with a lot of these kids is kind of stretching them a bit more. You know, I'm seeing too many smart kids where they haven't learned basic skills, like how to shop, how to do the most basic stuff. And so one of my big things that I've been talking about is job skills. When I was 13 years old, mother got me doing a little sewing job. When I was 15 years old, I went out to my aunt's ranch. And at first I was afraid to go. The mother says, well, I think you can handle it for about a week. Well, after about a week, um, I ended up um, wanting to stay there. And I really did build the gate that you could open up from the car. When I was in college, I did internships. You know, we got to start thinking in middle school, what are kids going to do when they grow up? And I'm really appalled at how the educational system now is taking out so many of the hands-on classes. Mm -hmm. You know, things like art, music, woodworking, welding, drafting. 
Well, there's a lot of uh, jobs out there for, let's say, for welding right now. There's a lot of jobs for certified welders. There's a shortage of things like plumbers and electricians. There's a lot of um, you know, things out there. The other thing you got to do with kids is you got to show them interesting stuff. You know, I got all fixated on that optical illusion room. And I really did spend six months figuring out how to build that. You want to get kids fixated on that kind of stuff. Now, autism is a very important part of who I am. But autism is secondary to my career working with livestock. I'm seeing too many kids come up to me and they want to just talk about autism. No, I'd rather talk about medieval knights, talk about um, their interest in science, or they like to do computer programming, or something like that. You know, I'd like to talk about those kind of things. Because the thing is, I come out here, Silicon Valley, half the people there have Asperger's. <laughs> then I go back to Kansas, or I go down to the southeastern United States, and the kids are getting addicted to video games, and they're going nowhere. You know, they weren't, they're the same guy, it's the same geek. This is what makes me kind of nuts. Now, a question I often get asked is since there's been a lot of bad things going on in the livestock industry, how did, you, how did it manage to stay in it so long? Well, when I started out in the 70s, I started out in Arizona. And they had big feedlots out there, but they stayed really dry, six inches of rain a year, and they had shade. All the cattle had shade. So the living conditions were good. Handling was terrible. But I could see handling as something that I could fix. You know, if I had been first exposed to cattle, you know, two foot deep in mud, maybe my career would have gone another way. But I wasn't. You know, it was lucky that I was raised in, in Arizona. And then there were people in the industry that even back in the bad old days that did a good job. There were meat plants that did a good job. There weren't very many of them back then that did a good job, but there were some. There was an excellent um, Singing Valley Ranch in Arizona, Bill and Penny Porter. Um, they were very much involved in my cattle formative years, and they handled their Hereford cattle absolutely beautifully. Those cattle had a really good life that was worth living. So I knew that animal ag could be done right. Now, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of improvements in the big slaughter plants. Like, I got asked by one of the members of the press, well, aren't you just helping them to slaughter more animals? I'll tell you right now, the plants are the same size now as they were in the late 80s. These big plants, they, they handle the same amount of cattle per hour now as they did 20 years ago. That hasn't changed. And one of the really important things you got to change, you got to change the management. When I first started out, I thought I could fix everything with engineering. In the 70s, I thought if I could just build the right system, everything would work fine. Uh-uh. You got to have the management to go along with it. So I got a lot of systems in. Half of the cattle in the U.S. are handled in equipment I designed. But people weren't managing it right. Oh, there were a few that managed it right. And then in 1999, I was hired by McDonald's and Wendy's Corporation to implement their animal welfare system. And I came up with a very, very simple way to score animal welfare using outcome variables, like how many cattle fell down during handling, how many cattle were mooing and bellowing their heads off in the slaughter chute, how many cattle did you poke with the electric prop, how many cattle did you shoot correctly on the first shot and put them down on one shot. That's stuff I could measure. And when we first started, it was terrible. Only 30% of the plants could shoot 95% of the cattle with a single shot. This is back in 1996. Okay, why was it so bad? They simply did not maintain their equipment. That was management. And then I um, worked with the McDonald's auditors, training them how to do the really simple scoring system, kicked a few plants off the approved supplier list, and there's been a lot of changes. Things are there still problems, and then maybe, um, you know, mid-2000s, then I got really big into working on some of these little plants. We were actually in kind of the weird situation where maybe around 2005, the big plants were better than some of the little plants. The thing I have found about the little tiny slaughter plants, they're either really good or they're really awful because they're so dependent on the personality of the owner. And then some little plants just don't know how to do things right. My, one of my students um, did a study where we figured out very simple ways to improve stunning of pigs. The good news is, is that most of the things to make a slaughter plant have good animal welfare don't cost a lot of money. Out of 75 plants on the original McDonald's and Wendy's supplier list, only three 
had to build really expensive things. The other ones we fixed were a lot of simple things. Non-slip flooring. Oh, we put a lot of non-slip flooring in. Uh, lighting up a chute that was too dark. Cattle are afraid of the dark. Putting up a piece of uh, metal so the animals didn't see a vehicle going by. Put up a conveyor belt curtain so they didn't see people walking by. Block up a hole in the roof where a sunbeam came in. Just very, very simple things like that we were able to fix most of the plants. Plus lots of training and lots of supervision. Now the Cargill Corporation now has put in uh, video auditing where auditors over the internet watch over stunning, they watch over truck unloading, they watch the cattle coming up the chute. And that solves the problem of people acting good when people are out there with clipboards and seeing what's going on. So there's been a lot of things that improved. There's still problems. There's still an occasional plant that does something really stupid. Really, really stupid and bad. Some of that's still going on. But the industry as a whole has improved a whole lot. Another thing that's been a problem is sort of the warfare between big ag and little ag. I'm so sick and tired of that kind of warfare because both animal agriculture, I'll work with both, and I, I think you know the, a lot of the kind of things you're doing here may become 25% of the market. But then you go out in the low income areas of the United States, I mean they're going to have to have affordable eggs. And there's things that need to be improved in big ag. And one of the things I've said to big ag is you need to open up the door electronically. There are a few places that have done that. J.S. West, that's a, a, a chicken place that, um, you know, eggs. Uh, has a, it is a caging system, but it's a better caging system where the birds have a private nest box. They've got perches. These are things that the birds want. And you can go on the J.S. West website and you can look at the live hen cam. Fair Oaks Dairy in Illinois has put in a camera where you can watch cows calving. And I've got videos up on YouTube. Just type in Temple Grandin cattle, Temple Grandin pigs into YouTube, and I've got videos showing my slaughter stuff. Now, there's some people in the industry that want to call it harvest facility. That's a bunch of BS. That is just BS. And they don't, some people in the industry don't like it when I use the S word. And I said, well, I went out to Hollywood, and I used the slaughter word in a big Hollywood press conference. You know, well, that's harvesting. We do that with grain, not with cattle and pigs. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> and we need to be just showing what we do. I've taken a lot of people through the big plants they got in Colorado, and they're kind of surprised how quietly the cattle get off the trucks. They expect them to get off the trucks crazy. Well, they get off the trucks just like they'd be getting off the truck at a ranch. You know, they, if, if they're scared of something, it's novelty. That, that's the thing. And the kind of cattle... They get afraid of something like an umbrella opening. There's an interesting experiment that was done over in Europe where they tested cattle just uh, with a spring-loaded umbrella where it just opens up suddenly. Did that out on the farm. And some cattle really get excited when you get scared when you do that. I know that cattle don't even hardly move when you do that. And the ones that got really scared of the umbrella on the farm, also their heart rate and their stress hormones went way up at the slaughterhouse because they get scared of novelty, uh, you know, really easily. You know, and sudden novelty scares. I think what I want to do right now is we may not be able to take questions from the back, but I'll take some questions from up here in the front where I can hear, and I will repeat the questions. And um, maybe they're going to have a mic to pass around. That would be really, really nice. Okay. Okay. All right, let's talk about that. Okay, let me just repeat the question. The question was, in my book, Animals in Translation, I talked about the pressure effect on dogs and on cattle. And if you, anyone who saw the HBO movie, and incidentally, it is available on DVD on Amazon. <laughs> um, the, um, so good. So good. You will know about my squeezing machine that I developed. And I got the idea for the squeezing machine from a cattle squeeze chute. When I went out to my aunt's ranch, I was having horrible anxiety attacks. When I got into puberty, I started having these horrendous anxiety attacks like I felt like being in a constant state of stage fright all the time. It was horrible. I was desperate for relief. I noticed that when they put the cattle in the squeeze chute for their vaccinations, 
that sometimes they kind of relaxed. So I went and tried out the cattle squeeze chute. And then I built a squeezing device. And there's a lot of people that seek pressure. There's deep pressure over wide parts of the body calms you down. And now there's several companies like Anxiety Wrap, Thunder Shirt, that make these like pressure vests that you can put on dogs to help calm them down during thunderstorms. Now the pressure effect works the best if you put it on for just 20 minutes. You know, you do it more or longer than 20 minutes, then the effect kind of wears off. You know, so you'd want to put it on just as the storm was coming so that they, um, you'll have the maximum effect, you know, when it's thundering and lightning outside. But pressure will wipe parts of the body's common. Now, little t tickle touches, let's say just barely touch the hairs here, that sets an alerting alarm reaction. And I want to mention one other thing. Don't pat your dog like this or your horse. Don't pat. Stroke it. Stroke it. Make it feel like the mother's tongue. Don't do tickle touches. Stroke it. We have, we have a microphone here. Um, one idea is, why don't we have folks with questions line up over here where we have a microphone? And that way everyone can hear the questions. So, uh, right over there is a mic. And if you have a question, just go ahead and line up right over there. Okay. Sierra Salen from Fairfax. You mentioned earlier about how most people, how autistic people could think in two or three different ways. Yes, that's right. And other people could only think in maybe one way. Well, a normal, so-called normal people have some of the tendency to be visual. See, visual thinking is a continuum. So there's... Uh, my visual thinking, I can actually test run something in my mind. My question is, can you teach people how to think autistically? That's a really good question. And I think that visual thinking's on a continuum. Well, let's just say this stage, the width of this stage is a continuum. And the extreme visual thinker like me is here on this end. And the extreme word thinker that when I ask the church steeple question might just get some lines like that is on this end. Now, if I work with that word thinker, maybe I can move them to here on the stage. I'm not going to get them all the way to the other end. There's just too much uh, innate uh, wiring I was born with to fight. If you have somebody that's in the middle, I can move them some. Let's say I say, think about a highway overpass, think about a church steeple, and the person gets a vague generalized one. And then I say, now shut your eyes and think specific. I can then force them to think specific. Most people, I find, can do that. They tend to get the generalized one first. And what neuroscience has learned is that generalized steeple comes out of the association cortex. And the specific one comes out of, you know, probably more the more primary uh, parts of the visual cortex. It's, it's uh, you know, the brain is kind of hierarchy, and then as you move up in the hierarchy, uh, things get more and more abstract. But you can't make a, a, a person that's a total non-visual thinker do 3D virtual reality in their head the way I can. I find most non-autistic designers, and I've talked to a lot of designers in the meat industry, people that are very good at laying out the whole entire plant, they can lay out the plant and see the equipment. They can't run the plant. I can actually turn on the plant and run it. Awesome. And I, I didn't know for many years other people couldn't do that. I can make the equipment run. Like the Denver airport, for example, put in this barcode scanning system for bags that I could have told you would have never worked. <laughs> you know, they were going to have uh, bags going by in these little carts, and they expect this barcode reader to read a, a the label that's on a soft bag that's around at every weird angle. There's no way. They ended up tearing it out. It was a hundred million dollar mistake. They tore the whole entire thing out. This brings up another important thing. On projects, we need the different kinds of minds working together. Like a lot of my books, I have a co-author, because a visual thinker can't do the structure. Thinking in pictures, I don't have a co-author, but I kept everything real short chapters on a single subject. Because visual thinking is not linear. It's associative. Uh, also, on designing a lot of things, to say Silicon Valley, for example, you'd put a visual thinker and a computer programmer together. In other words, the art, the more art person takes something like an iPod, iPad, well, all Steve Jobs' patents are design patents, you know, so it's the picture, 
But then you've got to have the engineer to make the insides of the thing work. You've got to have the two kinds of the minds working together, the pattern thinker and the visual thinker working together on projects. Okay? I have two questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, number one is, why do you think dogs or other animals, and, and people too, would have a fear of something that they've never been exposed to? Like an animal being afraid of water, or a person being afraid of, you know, any anything that they haven't ever been exposed to. Like you have a puppy, and you know that dog's never even been around water, or it's, you know, or any other thing, you know, like it's afraid of a certain kind of plastic thing, you know what I'm saying? Why would it? Notice, why would it be afraid of something he's never seen before? Yeah, or experience. Well, let me tell you another one, and then I'll tell you why he's afraid. Um, dogs, when they raise service dogs, puppies in prisons, and they get them out, they're scared to death of trees. Now, the thing about totally new things, new things are both scary and attractive. If you take that puppy and just ram him up there to the water, you might make him permanently afraid of it. Hmm. New things are scary if you, they're shoved in your face. That's why the umbrella opening is used as a sort of a fear and novelty test. But new things are attractive if the animal can voluntarily approach. Like let's say I took that umbrella and it's not windy and I just put it out in the middle of the pasture, all the horses and cattle are going to go up to it. See, in your brain, you've got circuits for fear, but you also have circuits for seeking, for seeking novelty. And there's a switch in the brain, it's called the nucleus accumbens. And it can either be in fear mode or seek mode. Because when I put a clipboard out in the middle of the cattle pen, the cattle came up to the clipboard and had a piece of paper on it. But when the wind blew the paper, then they backed away. Then when the paper stopped blowing, then the cattle came up to it. So you're switching back and forth between seeking and fear. And the best thing to do is just gradually and carefully introduce the puppy to water, make sure First experiences with new things are good first experience. This applies to just everything. Make sure when you put a horse on a horse trailer the first time, he has a good first experience. Because if first experiences with something new are really scary, then you may have a permanent fear memory. And the animal that has the more flighty genetics is more likely to have that problem. That's number two. Um, I rescued a police dog, so I didn't know her in her early years. But I couldn't understand why one time we'd be sitting outside having dinner, you know, where she's exposed to public. Sometimes she would, you know, lunge at someone, and sometimes she wouldn't. And people weren't doing anything any different. And they're walking by, and I'm trying to determine what is that trigger that's making her... Was she lunging at people, like, becoming a police dog again? Yes, exactly. Okay. But not everybody. Just Well, probably she was lunging at people that looked similar to the... Um, People she went after with the police. Sometimes it was I don't a know. Child, sometimes it oh, was a child? child? Okay. Sometimes it was an adult. Okay, now a child, a child she may not, not, may not know what it is. It's very important to train dogs that toddlers and babies are children too. You know, they've been, puppies need to learn that really young. Now that reflects really bad police dog training because the police dog puppies need to be trained that you never go after kids. Never, ever, ever, ever. You know, if they're, if they're um, you know, this tall or shorter, you just leave them alone. And you get them socialized little kids. But, if they, but dogs that have never seen little kids will often treat them like prey. And that can be very, very dangerous. I can't emphasize enough the importance of getting puppies socialized to children. That's just so, so important. See, the thing is, this little person that's this high is a different picture than a big person that's this high. I wondered if she was picking up something intuitively about that person. Well, she'd be picking up something sensory. It could be a smell. It could be the some. Usually, they pick up on some fairly obvious sensory-based feature, like a certain big hat, glasses, beards. Could it be that person's fear? Yes, it, it could be the person's fear. Animals will pick up on. People that are afraid of. Them. Let me tell you a story about a rancher that had a bull. This story is kind of politically not correct, but it really, really illustrates a point. And this rancher came up to me at this cattle meeting, and he goes, "I tried to get this bull into the trailer, and he wouldn't go in the trailer. So I got a pistol, and I put a pistol in my pocket, and I walked out of the house with that pistol in my pocket, and I kept it in my pocket, and never took it out, and the bull went on the trailer." He said, well, why did that happen? 
I said that gun gave you confidence. When you had that gun in your pocket, you weren't afraid anymore. And that changed the way your demeanor and your posture in subtle ways, and the bull picked up on that. And the dogs may be picking up on something like that. Hi. I'm wondering if you consider the words autistic, Ansperger's, high-functioning, low-functioning spectrum as helpful or as dangerous to the situation? Well, they, um, you know, the basic way they're we're talking right now on changing the, um, the, the uh, DMS-5 uh, diagnostic, if I take the Asperger's out and just call everything autism spectrum, and you have different uh, the severities along the autism spectrum. You see, there's a point where Silicon Valley genius and Asperger's is the same thing. There's a point where when you get, I'm, no, I'm serious. I am serious about this. You know, there's a point where geek and nerd and Asperger's is all the same thing. You see, I think a little bit of an autistic trait is just normal variation. Because the other way you could go on variation is people that are super big social yak yaks. I mean, think back in the caveman days. Who do you think made the first stone spear? It certainly wasn't the social yak yaks around the campfire, that's for sure. <laughs> Temple, um, thank you for your work. I run a social thinking center in Marin for kids uh, all, on all kinds of issues. And um, I'm wondering, you know, there is a big emergence right now in social skills and social thinking development for kids. And what most do you want people to know who are either teachers or just professionals like me out there working with kids um, in terms of how you would, as an autistic child, have liked to have had these social thinking groups apply and any materials you recommend? Well, I recommend getting kids out in the real world. Don't do fake shopping. Don't do fake uh, you know, cooking and things like that. You want to teach in the real activity. You go out to a restaurant, and okay, if you don't have very much money, you can buy one dollar item off the menu, and they got to go up there, talk to the clerk properly, give them the money, say please and thank you. Uh, you learn how to cook. You got to I went to one school and they cooked the most delicious brownies I'd ever had and I was real cooking with real stuff. You teach things out in the real world and let's say they, he forgot to say thank you to the clerk, then you, 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 after you get back to the table you kind of critique them, well you forgot to say thank you, don't embarrass them up there in front of the clerk. Now one of my worst things socially when I was in high school was being teased. I had to be taken out of a large school because I was constantly teased. And the only places I could go where I could get away from teasing was special interests. Horseback riding, electronics lab. We need to be getting these kids into special interest things. Art, Lego Mindstorm robots, you know, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, Future Farmers of America, um, music programs. Because it was in the special interest groups where I was with peers where there was no teasing, where I got along. But as far as teaching social skills, let me tell you, three Miss Manners meals every day. And I was expected to do things right. If I twirled my fork around up here like this, Mother would say, put it back down on the table. She didn't scream at me. she just give the instruction. Okay, eat mashed potatoes with your hands. She just said, uh, use the fork. And one time in school, we had chocolate ice cream for dessert. And I went like that, like a dog. And the teacher just very calmly took it away and said, you're not a dog and took it away. You know what? I never forgot that. <laughs> she didn't scream at me. She just calmly took it away and says, you know, I talk. You know, but, but everything was taught in the real world. You see, in the 50s, that was normal 50s upbringing. I'm seeing more and more problems today with kids where they just aren't taught the social skills. All kids were taught these things. And the rules were the same at our house, at the Woods house, and the Culver's. The Culver's are a bit more strict. Had, you know, like one thing I learned at Mrs. Culver's house is that you can't cut all your meat up all at once. You cut it off one piece at a time. And Mrs. Culver told me that was bad manners. And I was allowed to do that at our house. Hi, Temple. Claude Hill. I'm wondering if, at, uh, how young can autism be diagnosed and what would the symptoms be? Well, there's some research done um, by Sally Rogers, and um, there's been a new program in Denver called the Denver Start Program, and they're finding in very young babies, you know, a year old or so, you can start to say symptoms, I'm going to call it at risk for autism. This is the baby that doesn't play peekaboo. This is the baby that's sometimes too good and it just lays around. 
It doesn't smile when, you know, at people. It doesn't have eye contact. It doesn't have joint attention. And this is the kid where the grandmother that's had a lot of experiences working with, with little baby, with lots of grandchildren, could go, this baby's not right. And that will start to show up in a year. So what would you do with that baby? Just do extra contact, extra interaction with it. But, and the research is really clear that when you see definite autistic symptoms, the worst thing you can do is wait. You've got to get people working with it 20 or 30 hours a week. You know, uh, uh, you, you know get people interacting. But then you've got to be careful not to drive them into sensory overload. If this is the baby that screams every time you take it into the supermarket, that's an indicator it may have sensory overload. You know, and some kids can't stand fluorescent lights because they can see the flicker of fluorescent lights. And uh, that's one of the biggest uh, environmental problems in the schools right now. And it doesn't apply just to autism. It can apply to dyslexia, ADHD, and many, many other disorders. Let me tell you something you can do. If you ever, anybody, if you ever had the print jiggle on the page and you go to read, especially when you're tired, try, try reading on the nook. Or the, or the, you know, the uh, Kindle. Although the Kindle, but you have the gray background, reading on the Kindle because that reduces the contrast. Try printing the book onto like pa pastel paper. Another thing to try is um, pale colored sunglasses. Pale purple, pale, you know, just all the different pale colors. You know, maybe experiment with the, you go down to the theater department if your school, if they still have a theater department. And, uh, they play around with some broken old glasses frames with those gel papers they put on the lights. Then you find a color that works. You can have the optician shop make it for you. Or you can get Erlen lenses. Now that's probably going to cost you $700. So I always like to tell a low income way of, of doing it. But I had a dyslexic student who would have flunked out of school if she hadn't had those glasses. And I'm finding in my livestock handling class, I have my students do drawings, and I'm finding one or two students out of every class of 50 or 60 that has this problem. And these students absolutely cannot draw. And I tell them to get the colored paper and to, um, you know, maybe uh, do their homework on the Kindle if possible. Uh, try changing the colored background on their computer. And they get, they got to, you know, old TV monitors are terrible. Uh, these kind of monitors here flicker. Uh, but the iPads and the, the tablets and the laptops don't flicker. You know, read on that. And I have a lot more information on this and thinking in pictures and also my The Way I See It book, second edition. Uh, it's not at the book stand here, but the, all the you know, bookshops have it. Okay. Oh. I'm Greg Yates. Uh, there's a young scientist at USC, Jared Reeser, who has proposed that uh, many autism genes are actually adaptations to sparse conditions on frontiers. It's what he calls the solitary forager hypothesis. What do you think of that idea? Well, I think there's a lot of different genetic types of thinking that have value. Let's take the ADHD. They might be really good at foraging. Um, you know, I think a brain can either be more cognitive or be more, more social. You know, there's different situations where more cognitive would be advantageous to more social. Um, I, since I'm a bottom-up thinker, I'm going to tell I, I, what I've been saying, think of it in a little more general sort of way. But then you wonder, why do traits like depression, ADHD, autism, why do these things uh, remain? Because in their very mild forms, they can give some advantages. Okay, um, one more. Okay. Um, I had a hard, real hard time understanding people and people's behavior uh, when I was young. And as a young adult, I started having pet rabbits. And I felt like my rabbits taught me how to understand people. And I learned so much from my rabbits that I kind of learned to get along with people. Do you think different animals have different things to teach us? Well, I think animals can be very, very helpful. I've talked to a lot of parents where they've said their child's first word was, well, they were riding a horse. Well, one of the things that makes that work is you have your rhythm and balancing. But animals can be really, really uh, good. The thing I have found about people on the autism spectrum working with animals is that for one kid, they're the best buds of the dog. That is just that they totally understand the dog. And then there's another kid that's kind of afraid of the dog at first, but then when he warms up to it, he really likes the dog. And then there's some that hate animals because they can't stand the, the, their uncertainty. Like it may bark, and when it barks, it hurts their ears. And that's where the dog is probably not going to be helpful. 
You know, again, it's not one size fits all. But for some individuals on the autism spectrum, um, animals can be absolutely wonderful. Okay, I think we're going to have to stop. And yeah, everyone, oh. let's, let's thank Temple for coming out. Yay! Stand. It's just kind of over that way. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a good signing afterwards. Um, you know, you can join her over there. And, and please hang around. We do have a lot more planned. Uh, there's a lot more music and other things.